Now, as the 10th anniversary of 9-11 approaches, we look back with a veteran foreign correspondent at the long years of war in Afghanistan, where American troops have fought ever since the attacks on the U.S. Now, after more than a decade of conflict, the Kunar Edward Jarday has been part. reporting from Afghanistan since 1979, just before the Soviet invasion of the country, including stories produced for the news hour. For most Afghans, the war is far from over. Along the way, he's trekked hundreds of miles through rugged mountains and had innumerable adventures, including a 1989 encounter with Osama bin Laden and his Arab fighters. In early September 2001, Jurde was waiting to interview Ahmed Shah Massoud, a key resistance leader, when he met a pair of North African men who said they were television journalists also there to interview Massoud. In fact, the two were suicide bombers dispatched by al-Qaeda. And their assassination of the popular Afghan fighter foreshadowed the 9-11 attack on the United States just two days later. Girardet's new book, Killing the Cranes, is filled with such details, mixing personal experience with the history of a country at war for nearly 30 years. And Edward Girardet joins us now. Welcome. Thank Welcome back, Thank I you. should say. <laughs> Killing the Cranes, the, t the name comes from a story you tell of meeting with an Afghan friend of those large white birds that usually fly over the sky in Kabul, and he looks up and he realizes it's not there, and, the, and he says, have we even killed the cranes? Sadly, yes. It, it was basically symbolic, meaning that um, when in end of March the cranes used to fly over Kabul, migrating from the south to the north to Siberia, and he said he hadn't heard a single crane since being back in Kabul. This was 2004. And we had been discussing the impact of war, years of war, uh, almost 30 years of war, on Afghans and how it traumatized them. What, what is it about Afghanistan uh, for you? No other word seems to fit than, than a kind of romance of this country. What I'm, is it? I'm, I'm a dead romantic. I mean, I, I've... And I think, I think this happens to everyone who goes to Afghanistan, whether an aid worker, e even the military. They, if they have a close contact with the country, they become drawn by it. It's an extraordinary place. It, you, people talk to you in equal terms. Topographically, it's an amazing country, the high mountains, the deserts. And the fact that I was fortunate enough, even during the height of the war, the Soviet war, for example, of being able to walk, to trek through Afghanistan. And I always felt, you know, I was getting paid to, to cover the country, and yet it was always a, a pleasure and a, and a joy, despite the war. And of course, coming in at a moment when so much was about to change and the reverberations are still very much with us. Yeah, I know you, it's... Uh, covering, covering Afghanistan now, it's much more different. During the Soviet period, I felt that it wasn't that dangerous. It was a calculated risk. Nowadays, it has become extremely dangerous. And I would not fault any journalist for not wanting to cover Afghanistan. It has become much more dangerous today. I want to talk about some of these experiences. I mentioned the encounter with um, Osama bin Laden in 1989. It was actually a kind of a debate with this man, and you didn't know till much later who he was, right? Well, I arrived. Uh, I was actually preparing for McNeil Lehrer piece, and I got into recce. And I encountered a group of Arabs, Arabs in the trenches. And this very tall Arab came up to me and said, what are you doing here? This is not your jihad. And I sort of resented him asking me who I was and what I was doing. And I said, you know, I'm a guest in this country just as you are. And I will leave if my host required that I leave, just as I'm sure you will leave if they want you to leave. You were both foreigners, right? We were both foreigners. <laughs> and, and so we had this rather absurd debate for about 45 minutes, although it became, it became rather interesting. And we talked about... Ali Kitab of the book, uh, being Jewish, being uh, Christian, or being Muslim. And one thing I did point out was that, you know, Afghans do have a sense of civilization and they respect their guests. Uh, he saw it differently. He said that they were here for the jihad. Afghanistan did not matter. And they were going to fight all enemies, whether Soviets, whether Americans, uh, Israelis. And that was the first sense that there was a global uh, objective in mind for him. And when was it that you realized who it was you had been dealing with? It was years later when in Kabul one of the one of the commanders I knew from there said, you remember that very tall Arab you met back then? That was bin Laden. And then of course it dawned. But you know during the the end of the 1980s we had no clue who bin Laden was. He was one of many jihadists from you know Saudi Arabia, Egypt, Chechnya, 
who were fighting alongside the Afghans or fighting their own war alongside the Afghans. And amusingly enough, the Afghans, the Mujahideen, kicked out the Arabs at the end of the 1980s because they're getting too arrogant. They, they were outsiders and they resented them. And this has always been the Afghan approach to people who are no longer guests. Another um, stunning, striking episode. And you begin the book with the, and I referred to this meeting with uh, waiting for Masood, right? And then you left before he showed up and then found that he had been assassinated. You knew him well. And you write about that assassination as a pivotal moment for yourself and also in the history of Afghanistan. Well, it changed everything, I think. Uh, in early 2001, Massoud had actually warned the Americans in, in Paris. He went to Paris in April 2001, and he warned them that there was going to be an attack against the West, possibly the United States. He also warned that there should not be any intervention, military intervention in Afghanistan, but that pressure should be brought on the Pakistanis. Because in those days, before 9-11, the, the Taliban was being heavily supported by the Pakistanis, mainly the ISI, the military intelligence, and by al-Qaeda. And his argument was that without such support, it would collapse. And in fact, the Taliban at the time were already in the process of imploding. Time after time, you write here, outsiders have gotten things wrong, even catastrophically wrong in Afghanistan. Why is that, do you think? Afghans are they're very proud people, and I think they resent having outsiders coming to tell them what to do. The British discovered that <clears throat> during the 19th century, in three wars, uh, two in the 19th century, one in the 20th, the Soviets discovered that, and after that, even al-Qaeda discovered that, and the Pakistanis discovered that everyone is trying to go in with their own agendas and not for the Afghans themselves. And I think this was also the problem post 9-11, that when the US, Britain, and other coalition countries got involved, we went in telling the Afghans what to do. We sought to impose our own vision of Afghanistan. And this is what I think a lot of ordinary Afghans have resented. There was a lot of um, you know, welcoming in the beginning. People thought, finally, the war is over. But in fact, when they saw that the US and others put back the, the warlords, put back a lot of the people who had discredited themselves during the 80s and 90s in Afghanistan, they realized that things were not going to change. And where are we today, do you think? I mean, you write a lot about how military victory has never been mm. and probably still is not achievable. I think there's absolutely no military solution whatsoever. And, and I can understand why the military would arg argue against that. But the fact is, nothing has been achieved. And if you look at the Soviet war, what are the, have they left behind? The only way, I think, to deal with Afghanistan is by focus on what needs to be done, such as recovery, and let Afghans take the lead. Also, they, they want justice. You know, we cannot go in there and impose justice with military means. And the reality is that despite even a lot of the good efforts, for example, building bridges or roads, this is not what brings peace. You have to involve the local community. And you have to start talking to everyone. And this means talking with the Taliban and other insurgents. It's not just the Taliban these days. It's people within the government and ordinary Afghans. And unless you bring them to the table, nothing's going to happen. And briefly, are you, even after 30 years of sorrow, war, bloodshed, are you optimistic about this country that you, that you clearly love? Yeah. No, I, I'm, I am optimistic because Afghans are an incredibly resilient people. They always seem to pull back, even in the hardest of times. And I think, you know, amongst a lot of young people, for example, more than half the population, of course, under 25, they're tired of war. Afghans are really tired of war. But this means everyone. It also means the Pashtuns who are supporting a lot of the Taliban. And I think the, the, the real hardliners, the, the, they're a minority. But it, nothing's going to happen, I think, until the occupation is brought to an end and the real focus is on recovery again. All right, the book is Killing the Cranes, Personal Experience and History of Afghanistan. Edward Jaradeh, nice to talk to you. Thank you very much.